now get started. Thank you all for coming to the uh, Manhattan Motors Hypercar CEO Summit. We have an amazing hyper panel today, um, and I'm honored to have them all here. Let me just go down the list. Uh, Haldora Koenigsegg is the COO of Koenigsegg. Um, Jim Lickenhaus of Lickenhaus. Um, Mate Remac of Remac, and um, Neil Briggs of VAC. Thank you all so much for coming today. Um, so I think the idea of a hypercar, we had sports cars, and then we had to rename cars that were even more expensive and faster, supercars, and then we have hypercars. Um, what is a hypercar, and some of this is just semantics, but what sets each of your cars apart from anything else on the market right now? Um, we are really even calling our cars mega cars. And, mega cars. Uh, oh, yes. Okay. Because the hyper hyper car was not enough. Too uh, common. To, hyper cars are too common. <laughs> to explain where we were going with uh, the one megawatt of power that we uh, that we had in our uh, first in the one to one. Um, but of course, I mean. We are the pinnacle of, of engineering art, and uh, we uh, do ground, groundbreaking technology, and um, and both within all all areas: uh, car design, composites, uh, mechanics, engineering in in, in the engine. Uh, I mean, there are so many levels that we uh, that we uh, excel in, and and we also drive technology for more common cars. Which is very important. It's not only toys for rich people. It's yeah. also driving the technology forward, and I think that's important. Although for it everyone. helps to be rich for a three million dollar. It helps. It's, it's of course necessary, uh, but but in, in the beginning, all technologies are expensive. Right. And and we should all be thankful that we have a rich enthusiasts that want to share our passion and pay for this technology, so that all of us can can uh, get use of it in the future. And Jim, what about you? What what is how would you define your car and what sets it apart from everything, even the sort of one-off Ferraris of the world that the major manufacturers are making? Uh, we're really at the total opposite end of the spectrum. Um, we, we make sports cars. I mean, the car that you saw there with uh, restricted horsepower, 440 horsepower, and 165 kilos of ballast, did a six 33 at the Nuremberg. We build race cars, we race them, and then we make the world legal. Now, we are unique in one way. Due to the regime change that happened in the United States two years ago, when President Obama left and this other person came in, um, there was, uh, the first thing he did was he fired everybody at the EPA and NHTSA and there was no one there. And there's a magic rule in the United States that if you petition the government, they have 90 days by law to say yes, no, or do nothing. And if they do nothing, your submission is accepted. So we took the FAST Act and we submitted eight cars, none of which existed. And we went to NHTSA and made a 350-page submission that I hand wrote and then we typed up. And against long odds, 90 days passed, they did nothing. And under US law, we were deemed approved and we were the only <coughs> low-volume NHTSA manufacturer in the world. And frankly, the only one there will ever be. Because once that happened, they freaked out and uh, came to us and said, Jim, you know, blah, blah. And I said, blah, blah, what? We're in, you know, I'll see you in court tomorrow morning. Or, And now if you Google Glickenhaus and NHTSA, you will see a VIN decoder, and you can type it in, and all our cars come up. So for some very bizarre reason, we are not required to have airbags. We are not required to crash test. We have no federal motor vehicle safety. We are only allowed to make 325 cars a year, but, and you have to sign a waiver. And when my wife saw the waiver, she said, Jim, no one will ever buy one of your cars. It says, basically, this car can kill you, it will kill you. It can kill the passenger. If you don't put on your seatbelt and get a Darwin Award by an act of Congress, you can't sue us. So we're really a quite different company. We build race cars. We make them road legal, 
and we drive them. You know, there are a lot of cars you see in this building. I'd be willing to bet that we are the only car on the stand that drove from our factory down the West Side Highway in bumper to bumper traffic with the air conditioner on. <laughs> and uh, there's a picture and you can see it on, on the net. And we drove it in here. There was no truck. The guy said, where's your truck? I said, no, no, we're just driving in. And we got in line and drove it up here and drove it on the stand. And Monte, uh, speaking of emissions and safety, um, you have the C2 here today, which is your latest generation. Um, tell us about what electrification will mean to the idea of a supercar and a supercar experience. And if it's not that roar of the engine and that feel of the engine, and it's just pure speed, what will it be? First, thank you for a very cool story. Really, really interesting to listen. Um, so I started the whole thing because I didn't want to create just an electric version of a sports car just to make it electric, but actually to use the potential of electric power trains because I believed like it's difficult to get yourselves back in the mindset of 10 years ago when electric cars were considered dull and slow and ugly and something that you don't really want to have. So I was wondering why why is that? Like the electric motor is such a great machine, like why is nobody utilizing it to make the car fun and exciting and so on? So I started by doing this in my garage, building a E30 1984 BMW electric car, which I used to beat the crap out of gas-powered cars and racetracks, and uh, brought five uh, FIA and uh, Guinness World Records with that car. And uh, then I wanted to design a car around the potential of electric powertrains, really to use the packaging and everything. So the C2 is basically the body, the embodiment uh, of that. So where all of that is in one car. All of our experience or our know-how and where we want to show what we as a company can do but also what electric cars can do in general and that they can be better in almost anything than combustion engine cars of course there are different preferences um, you know i'm a petrol head as well so if i had a garage with 50 cars probably 45 of them would be would not be electric yeah um, because you know it's just um, you know i think when people think about electric cars today, they see that things have changed, there are, there's performance coming and so on. But, okay, noise, there is some noise, it's just different. And when you look at, you know, some supercars that are on the market, a lot of them are quite similar, like, you know, rear engine, eight cylinders, 12 cylinders, uh, three wheel drive, six speeds or seven speeds, I mean, they have differentiations, but then when you come into something that has four motors and 1,900 horsepower, it's so different and it gives you such a different experience that the one thing you might you know, uh, miss, the roar of a V12 or a V8, whatever, that uh, you get compensated for a lot of different aspects. And that's what we want to show, like really, that it can give advantages that are um, very different to, that you can do things that are not possible with traditional projects. And, you know, when we talk about, you know, when we talk about the experience of of driving and the idea that so many cars today have become computers and, and the technology is so good and the engineering is so good that you're basically removed from the process of driving. What I love about BAC is that it kind of seeks to bring that back, doesn't it? it that, that connection with driving in the road. Absolutely. We, we, we have one focus and that is the driving experience. And, uh, and to maximize that driving experience, whether that's on the road or whether that's on the track. And that's why the car only has one seat, because race cars have evolved over 60, 70, 80 years. The engine's been in the front, the engine's been in the back, they've been two seats. Uh, and look at where every Indy car is, where Formula One car is, and where Formula cars are, and they are, they are like that as a vehicle architecture for a very good reason, because it's the best. And if your focus is on being the best, then you, you have to use the best architecture, you have to work with the best suppliers, the best employees, and also the best partners, which is why we're, we're thoroughly, um, thoroughly excited about our new relationship with, with Brian Miller and, and his great team here at Man Manhattan Motor Cars. Well, it's an absolute pleasure for us to be here and, and share the stage with these guys. But as far as the driving experience is concerned, you know, we sell dreams, and you can dream about being Bobby Ray, Harlow, or whoever, whoever your, your favorite race car driver is, Formula One or anything, and you can you can you can own that dream. I know when, when we look at these cars that are two million dollars or three million dollars, we all wonder who is buying these cars, especially given that 
cars like the Jesco sold out in five days within the launch. Um, so Haldora, who are the customers, not by name, but who are the customers buying the Jesco and what countries are they from? Are they entrepreneurs? Are they more inherited wealth? And what is the typical age of a Jesco buyer? We, we sell all over the world, and uh, our customers, they vary in age. They're uh, from 20 and up. Um, but I would say that a uh, vast majority of our customers are entrepreneurs, and their uh, big portion are uh, self-made, that love that we as uh, the underdog can come and uh, show the established brands that, that you can do something different and uh, that with a small passionate team you can actually do something that the big big manufacturers can't and um, and i would guess all of you probably have a customer base that if there was one commonality other than added wealth it's that they're brave because they're not just doing the easy thing and buying a ferrari or buying a you know those are amazing cars but they're taking a risk, aren't they, when they're buying your cars? Yeah, absolutely. I think all the customers, um, we, we, we overlap customers. We have customers who own Koenigsegg and indeed uh, Remax too. You know, they, 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 they dare to be different. Uh, and, and I also think that they also like to be, in, in the purchase, they like to be part of our company. So to that extent, a lot of our customers become ambassadors for our business. It's how can I help in any way, shape or form. Um, and they'd like to be part of something that's growing and they like to think that they've contributed to it, which they absolutely have. We're very open-minded about our customers. A lot of the new uh, features on our car are a direct consequence of some of the feedback that we've had from our customers in terms of the ownership experience and the driving experience. And it's great to be able to share our passion for engineering and design with our customers and, 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 and in a vice versa way. There's talk uh, now that the trade deal with China looks like is going to be resolved fairly soon. There's talk about the next trade war possibly involving a tariff on European cars, um, possibly 20, 25%. Now, there's one point of view that says, well, these are people who have a lot of money, they don't care, it doesn't matter. But going down the line, what impact would it have on your business and where would that cost flow through to? Yeah, for us it would mean nothing because um, we're an American company, we build cars in Sleepy Hollow, New York, so I don't think there'll be a tariff on Sleepy Hollow. Um, <laughs> and, um, but in all seriousness, I, I, I don't think this is going to mean anything to anybody. Um, you know, Maybe for a little while it can affect a little bit, but I mean, if you, if you look around in the world and you see the tariffs and the tax that you have around the globe on, on cars like this, it's much, much higher yeah, than China, that. Malaysia, I mean, there you're talking... hundred percent. Two percent, yeah. And, they, and you, you still sell we cars still in China. We sell a lot of cars in China, yes. And so. in other countries of the world where the taxes are really high. And what about for Rima? Well, for us, the main business is uh, using the technology that we have here in our cars and selling it to other car companies. And those, you know, most of European car companies are our customers, but also some that are not from Europe. Um, so that's the main business for us, helping you know, Porsche is a shareholder in the company, that's a big deal, and as Dora said, um, what is important I think for companies like us is to you know, push the limits, and a lot of these things that we do in our cars can end up in other people's uh, and cheaper cars, like the free wheel technology that Kutizek is developing. So I mean, we have I think a similar customer market like Kutizek, selling internationally, but really, for us, the priority as a company is to help other car companies and to help the whole industry to go electric. Now, uh, the other big trend, of course, in cars is autonomous driving. And if you look at the high-end watch market, what happened when the smartwatch came out is everyone thought, well, that would be the death of luxury watches. In fact, it sort of carved out the middle and the bottom of the luxury watch market, but, but it actually drove business to the top because when everyone was wearing smartwatches, there was more demand for that handcrafted, truly special product. Each of you, autonomous cars, will you ever enter that market? And does it help your product down the road? So from our perspective, we, we thoroughly embrace autonomous vehicles because what it will do, we, we, we're advocates for the right tool for the right job, okay? And if, if, if you need a tool to have the best driving experience possible, then you buy our car and you'll probably use it at the weekend, 
okay? So if autonomous vehicles come in, all that's going to happen is, and I agree absolutely with, with, your, with your comparison with the luxury watch market, I think it will drive, I think that would be successful all of our brands and indeed the other luxury car makers as well because there will be more people out there who will want to enjoy their hobby of driving any of these cars that are represented here today at the weekend with like-minded individuals in ownership groups on events, whether that's road or track. So I can actually see the market expanding. And actually, if you look at the rise in the luxury goods sector over the last five years, it's doubled. And that's been, um, that's been reflected in luxury car sales as well globally. So it's an expanding market and I think it's one that's, that's a great opportunity for, for everyone here today. And uh, for us, the C2, it uh, actually has the autonomous driving features already inside. So we have eight cameras, 12 uh, ultrasonic sensors, uh, six radars, LiDAR, supercomputer in the car. So we are developing a system that's called driver coach. So not everybody who can afford a car like this can really use it. So we are developing a system that can like blend the two things. Like, you know, 10 years ago, people couldn't understand how performance driving and electric cars can go together. And today the same is true for, for autonomous driving. So we want to show that autonomous driving can actually enhance driving so if you are not the perfect driver and rarely anybody is you take the car to the track it shows you two perfect laps and if you like it can tutor you it can teach you how to be a better driver so it does two laps at high speeds autonomously yeah full autonomously on the so it's like you have a formula one driver uh, on your side and uh, the, the system can teach you like where to turn in where to brake where you can be better so we want to show that autonomous driving can enhance driving but actually what will happen is we think the same like with horses like our grandparents everybody had horses and today still people have horses but only the you know race horses right. Right. so the regular transport will, will be fully autonomous and shared but there will be people who will collect cars a very small portion of them but people will collect them and use them on race tracks. i like the horse analogy dora yeah koenigsegg is on the same uh, way as rinlach and, and we also believe strongly that that will be a uh, something that our customer will really enjoy to go on a racetrack and be, get that support and, and know exactly what line to take and how to uh, enhance their uh, driving skills. And, you, and also, if you're using your car, which many of our customers are, no one really enjoys driving in traffic or uh, in, in cities. I mean, then you can use your uh, autonomous driving and they will support you. So um, we're really totally different. We'll never have an autonomous car. Um, we love driving in cities. I drove that car in the French Quarter. I've driven it in Times Square. I've driven it in the snow. Um, you know, we are race, real race cars. We build. We race in real races. And um, if you want to drive one of our cars, we're very happy to have one of our race drivers sit next to you and uh, show you what to do. And if you want to race, you can. I mean, if you buy one of our Baja boots this November, you can run the Baja 1000 in it. So we're a little wacky and crazy that way. And, uh, but I'll say point blank, we'll never make an autonomous car. We frankly will never have uh, much electronics in the car. The only one we do, and maybe we could get together on this, and I'm being very serious, uh, we are going to be one of two companies that is going to race the 24 hours of the mall in the new LMP1 hypercar category. It's going to be Toyota and us. And in that, we are going to need a hybrid system for uh, basically to be petrol and hybrid. And this does interest us, and you know, maybe we should talk about it. Yeah. One, one quick question. I know we're running short of time, but um, one of the big trends when you look at uh, wealthy collectors is a move away from buying things toward experiences. And Dora, we were talking earlier about the Ghost Squad, and that with a lot of these brands that are truly special, buying the car is part of the value, but maybe even a greater value is being part of a club or a community where you meet other people who are passionate about that and sort of similar to you. And how are each of you building, whether it's through social media or events or special uh, drives, building a community that will be as valuable, if not more, than the thing itself, than the car itself? When it comes to the Jesco, we could see that we have a lot of reoccurring customers. Show people your pin, by the way. Yes, this is the, this is the ghost. The ghost squad. The ghost squad. Ghost squadron. Uh, so this pin uh, is worn by, proudly by our employees and all of our owners. And um, I think the community and, and the extended Koenigsegg family is uh, really, really important for the brand. And uh, we, we have driving events. Uh, we meet at shows like this, and 
um, we know that our customers they come together uh, and meet without us as well and um, I think it's uh, we can see that they, our customers are coming back and they're buying other models from us so the camaraderie the, the community is important and um, there are great businessmen and women uh, that share a lot of uh, passion for, for cars. Neil what about you do you is that happening around BAC? Or? Yeah, absolutely. We're, um, we're very fortunate that we do uh, various different events. It's organized by the chairman of our owners club, actually. Um, they've just taken over our, our organizing our, our events. But we do, we do some really crazy things. Uh, we go to places like the Isle of Man. Uh, they close the roads for us. Um, they do a whole, whole bunch of stuff. And, and, and it's, it's, it's the, the playground for the owners for four days. We're, um, we're doing uh, four days in the Alps this year. We're doing an event that's actually owned and hosted by one of our customers called the Best of Italy. It's a 26 kilometer stretch of road um, on what, what once was the Millimedia um, section. And it's, uh, it's just great because it's a celebration of anything with an engine. Our owners all get together um, and they're meeting new people all the time. They share the same common interests, common goals, common values, and uh, they become great friends. New friendships, are, uh, new friendships are born. It's great to see. And Monte, is that happening around Remark as well? Well, for us, I think uh, there is an interesting development where people who, who are interested in supercars but wouldn't have bought a combustion engine car because it doesn't fit to their lifestyle or, or their image, is now it's opening up now, like to open the microcar or supercar. Um, but I think, you know, we, we are still a fresh brand and that's why we are here and we work with uh, Brian and New Motor Cars and our other dealers to. Uh, to you know, get established. Uh, Königsegg has by far the biggest following, and you know, building in 20 years, and this is a marathon. It's not, it's not a sprint. It takes time to build the, the customer base and to get your name out, and to you know, it takes. You know, every year in Geneva, everybody knows there will be a bunch of brands that will appear, and then next year they will disappear. Um, it's difficult to be and important to be there, you know, all the time, show new things, delivering your promises. That's how we build the brand, and it's it's really long term game. We are still in the game uh, quite short, um, so yeah, we, we have to work hard to, to establish the brand like Phoenix uh, in the last few years. Um, we offer a, a lot of wacky, crazy experiences. You can buy one of our cars, we'll put you in the Baja 1000. If you come to the Nuremberg Ring at 3 in the morning, we'll uh, walk you through the pits and the mud with uh, 50,000 fans. If you wear an SCG jacket, you will not get out of there sober. They will make you <laughs> uh, You know, our Baja food, you know, you talk of adventures, we're gonna drive, we're gonna start in Times Square, we're gonna drive up to Alaska, we are gonna put pontoons on it, we're gonna cross the Bering Strait, go to the Road of Bones, go to the Trans-Siberian Highway, and drive to Paris and have dinner. Now, we've invited every SUV manufacturer in the world to join us on this. And it'll be interesting to see if any do. But uh, these are the kind of things that we do. And um, it's a very important thing. I mean, people come to the races, they watch us race, they come to the factory. Uh, we've had people come and move into the factory and help us build cars. I mean, so uh, we're very small and uh, we do a lot of crazy things. All right, well, I know a lot of us aspire to join each of your squadrons someday. Thank you so much for being here and for bringing these amazing cars. And thank you all for coming. Thank you very much.